Ishan, and you're welcome. It's obviously a pleasure to speak after Trevor Grantham. He definitely has a very, um, he promoted a very influential research institute in Germany, in London, which um, looks at uh, climate change. What does climate change mean for the world, for the world economy? What are the strategies available in order to adjust to climate change and also to reduce greenhouse gases? And from an economic viewpoint, why isn't it working that we are, can do something at climate change and and uh, not, uh, we know we're very doing very, uh, being very dynamic against the corona pandemic. What are the strategies uh, for the climate change pandemic? Um, uh, what um, uh, there is a central element that's re referred to by economists, and that is the costing of CO2. And I'm going to look into that in my paper, and basically. It doesn't cost the world to save the earth, and uh, that um, I would I would uh, not put a parentheses around it, but um, a question mark. So many of the um, recommendations we are hearing, and so why wouldn't it? Why it won't cost the world to save the earth? Um, so let me just start off with the question of why are we interested in this subject at all? This chart shows the rise in CO2 emissions since industrialization, and you can see how dramatically they have risen in the last couple of decades, a few decades, as economics, uh, economic, as the Asian societies have grown economically and industrialized, and China, and they have risen from two billion tons in the in the 60s and have, have rose even faster in the 90s and in even faster since the 2000s as China has accelerated its growth. It has now um, slowed down a bit. There's a sort of plateau value has been reached, but uh, they are now climbing again and just before the um, corona crisis arrived. And now we assume that this year the emissions will rise, uh, will drop by 6% because of the corona crisis. But the challenge we are facing is it's not enough for the emissions to fall by 6% in one year. They need to fall in the next 30 years in order to achieve the targets of the Paris Treaty. And and if the, the consequences of not achieving that are huge. And these emissions, they stay in the atmosphere and they aggregate in the atmosphere. And as a result, temperatures rise. And as temperatures rise, there are a number of consequences on various systems, which are very briefly referred to here. This is this is reasons called reasons for concern by the World Climate Council and what are the risks caused by climate change in various areas of the world and what are the reasons for concern? And so there are five reasons for concern and as temperatures rise, the chart shows that there are larger risks and consequences for the system, in particular for the uh, RFC1, which is unique and threatened systems, ecosystems, obviously, which you can see in the graph below, coral reefs, um, warm water corals, they are especially badly affected and possibly threatened with extinction. And are the RFCs are, uh, for example, number two, extreme weather events. The um, melting of the ice caps, and uh, the higher the temperatures rise, this chart, these charts show, the risks increase accordingly. 
in these various, as do the influential factors. As an economist, one tries to come up with uh, costs for this. And uh, anyone who, somebody who did that was William Northaus, who got the Nobel Prize in 2018, and he tried using integrated analysis models to estimate what the costs are for such uh, rising temperatures as I just described. On the other hand, what the best strategy would be to respond to these changes. And what you can do is picture a cost-benefit analysis, but not on for some project, but for, for this kind of climate change, which is an aggregate change, the cost of climate change as an impact on these various systems on the economy and you compare that with the benefits one would have by way of climate protection policies reducing emissions things like that and that is then described as the social cost of carbon so it not only has private costs it has social costs societal costs because the damages are costs for damages which affect all of us, and the societal costs are higher than the direct damage that one might have uh, caused by my own. If I, uh, it, it, I, my producing CO2 has consequences not only for me or for Germany, but all other people on the world for the ecological systems, the ecosystems. So, so between, there is a huge difference between own costs and societal costs. And William Nordhaus tried to determine what are the societal costs and what would be a reasonable price for CO2 to um, determine these costs, to specify these costs. And uh, from, from in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, he said there are various scenarios and he said that if we have a, if the, but the best policies would be that the cost of CO2 would be about 40 US dollars per ton of CO2. And and it sh now it should be around about uh, 90 US dollars. And that would then go grow, rise as um, the damages rise. If you take these figures as a the kind of realistic figure now, would be about 50 US dollars per ton of CO2 as reflecting the global damage costs. And you compare that with the current price prices, you'll see that there is a huge difference. The global current price, calculated by William Noyes, is three dollars. The social, the societal costs for CO2 emissions are, are 20 times higher than the private costs, which one has to pay if you have one ton of CO2 emissions. So that means that apparently the market is failing because the externality, externalities, in other words, my uh, the effect of my doing is not being considered in these calculations. And that's the reason why states, why governments have to uh, interfere in the markets to compensate between the private costs and those that should be borne by society. In other words, higher prices for CO2 and if you look at how these damages came about, then you have to consider that each ton that is being emitted has the same impact on the climate um, as the one from uh, something else. So it doesn't really matter if it is uh, my uh, car ride. Uh, I came by, by train today, so, you know, CO2 has also been used because of the electricity that was used by the train. So that is the same impact as a ton, let's say, comes from um, Chinese uh, 
power plant uh, fueled by coal. So in other words, a ton is a ton. Uh, the price of each ton should be the same no matter where it comes from uh, so that we can efficiently regulate. <coughs> it doesn't make any sense to ask for more money here in Germany than in China because we could do even more if we were to harmonize the prices. And the idea of the uniform prices for CO2 for the different projects in, across the sectors, across the countries, in the core is the economic instrument to combat climate change and these are the economic instruments so we use CO2 certificates or the CO2 tax um, and therefore we put an immediate price tag on any CO2 emission so look at how full the atmosphere is already just imagine a bucket this is a bucket that is being filled um, and as I said it all uh, is caused by the accumulated damage everything that is uh, being retained in the atmosphere so 6% because of Corona doesn't make much of a difference because the emissions are still in the atmosphere and uh, there is less being added, but there's still something being added. I'm going to start this simulation, take a look at it. I hope you can see it. Yeah, there we go. You see? It's uh, slowly, slowly filling up and you have in yellow the EU and blue the US and all of a sudden China, India join us and you see how fast we pick up speed and in the year 2019 we're actually 90% full to the brim. So in other words, the remaining budget that would be compatible with the Paris Accords, two degrees, would be about 400 gigatons of CO2 and that is basically 10 years of emissions the way we used to know it. And that means we have to act massively and reduce emissions massively so that the bucket doesn't spill over. And uh, that means the temperature cannot be rising more than two degrees. How can that be done? Well, either by um, lowering emissions. So this is a chart from uh, the last latest um, situation report um, from the council. Uh, look, this is what would help us remain below two degrees. Look at that. And if you, if you look at the charts, you see that uh, they go to zero at 2070 and then we actually go into the negative. So in other words, uh, in order to keep two degrees, uh, we have to be at zero in 2070 and then afterwards we have to be below zero to get more uh, CO2 from the atmosphere uh, in order to reverse the development. So as an industrial country, of course you want to um, have a bit more. If you uh, want more than two degrees, you have to reduce even more. And these are immense challenges. However, one of the statements from the situation report of the Climate Council was it doesn't cost the world to save the world if, if certain assumptions are being fulfilled, number one. All countries participate in reducing uh, greenhouse gases. All countries start immediately. We make use of all the technologies and we do it in an economic way that makes sense. And if you uh, divert from these assumptions, then it gets more expensive. And uh, at the moment, we are diverting all of us. Not all countries are doing the same. In the Paris Accords, uh, we assume that the threshold countries may probably be increasing their emissions over the next 10 years. Others' uh, assumptions are that um, 
We're not immediately starting with this reduction and look at uh, carbon capture and registration or negative uh, uh, emission um, technology that we don't have yet. And we don't uh, apparently don't want to develop, but these are of utmost importance to keep prices and emissions low. And we do not have a uniform CO2 price. Look at Germany, like I show, will show you in a minute. We have a development in the right direction, definitely, but there are so many smaller measures, uh, some of them uh, cancel each other out, and where it is not quite clear what uh, the real task of each instrument, what the real function of each instrument is. But we're moving in the right direction. And in Germany last year, we had this major discussion on the question of what do we do with the individual sectors, agriculture, buildings, traffic. Um, we don't have an explicit CO2 price for each individual sector. And um, the government decided using the fuel emission um, trading instrument, uh, I mean, that basically covers larger parts of the industry um, and uh, also includes those that so far have been outside. And basically, from an economic point of view, that's good news. Because with the right economic instrument, meaning putting a price on CO2, you can tackle the problem. But there are a great deal of problems in the implementation of this instrument. So how does it work? How does emissions uh, trading work? Well, the government decides how many certificates can be used. Um, each company needs one certificate per ton. So, therefore, the government needs to decide how many certificates can be used. And the companies can either get them for free or they can buy them in an auction or they can also buy it from other companies that are participating but they don't need who don't need them so what does it do the companies will always think it over is it worth my trouble to purchase the certificate or how about if I simply reduce my emissions because then I don't have to buy any certificate it's always better to buy on the market uh, if I only have expensive options that's not good and Emission reduction is always better, and then I can sell certificates um, as long as the costs for reducing my emissions are lower than uh, the certificates. So if you have low um, mitigation costs or avoidance costs, then that uh, uh, puts you in a better situation. Um, and this to and fro will happen up until the point where prices are such that the avoidance costs will be compensated and there will no, not be any more difference. And therefore, a mass-based instrument, um, quantity-based instrument, like the emissions trading system, will help to reduce CO2 emissions. I could also manage that by implementing a CO2 tax. Then I have the same price. And uh, again, companies would think it twice. Do I want to pay that tax or do I reduce uh, the emissions? So with one, I limit the quantity. And I don't know exactly what the price in the market will be. And with the CO2 tax, I simply determine the price. But I don't really know uh, what the result is in, in terms of what is the level of reduction that I have managed to bring about. So, that's why basically the emissions trading came uh, into being. I already mentioned how that works. Um, so, it's... Uh, the companies that are part of it trade with each other. So you reduce emissions there uh, where they are 
cheapest to reduce. Well, that's an important char uh, characteristic of it because the regulator does not know uh, where you have the cheapest avoidance options. And therefore, it is actually a way of finding out where is it cheaper to reduce. So here we have the emissions trading uh, in the field of um, the manufacturing industry and other sectors. And now in Germany, um, there is a special uh, German tradings uh, uh, that deals with traffic, um, construction, agriculture and uh, remaining industrial applications. So we need the same CO2 prices compared to from the old to the new system and, and they also have to be the same everywhere in the world. It's not enough if Germany does it, it has to be done everywhere. So, but what is it that the emissions trading can actually achieve? Well, so these are uh, the mitigation costs um, curve. Uh, so the BDI um, discussed with the companies what is it that can be achieved. And this is the f Federation of the German um, manufacturing industry. They said we can um, do that and in fact even make, not lose any money. Uh, Germany will be the precursor of this type of uh, new technology and uh, benefits from such a mitigation. And 95% it gets difficult if the other countries don't come along. So we have to make sure that we're not the only ones in Europe, but the countries around us also make efforts to improve the climate. But a large portion of the potential is something that can be attained here. So we have the mitigation costs for Germany here. How much does it actually cost to uh, reduce CO2? And you see, it's less than 100 euros per ton CO2. That would be the CO2 price then. Uh, and in many cases, um, that would be most of the reductions of Germany. That's the small blue bar that you see on the left-hand side. These are the ones that are already part of the emissions trading. So that's, of course, putting the Green Deal into effect. And bit by bit, step by step, uh, we will avail of ourselves of these potentials. So from the cheap options with strict regulation, uh, we go to high cost reduction options um, and at the same time CO2 prices will rise. So, but there are certain areas that will never be touched upon. Even in the ETS we may never be able to do anything about traffic or agriculture. Uh, because for them the options are too expensive. That's something that the emissions trading simply cannot do. And then we need uh, other uh, supportive instruments. And to make such expensive technology cheaper and put it to use, that is exactly what we strive to do here. So the economic package of the uh, government hydrogen plays a very important role in this. Today, the emissions reduction using hydrogen is much too expensive. And therefore, uh, we have R&D support, we have infrastructural investments, um, and again, here the costs are supposed to be reduced, and only then, afterwards, uh, we have reasonable costs and we can bring down the CO2, CO2 emissions. So some emissions that are expensive because they're in the future, 
future require support. But for a majority of the emissions, it would be enough if uh, we simply regulate using these options that I have just explained. And I'd like to conclude with the following remark. I said that we can achieve it, 80% down, but still uh, retain our competitiveness. If we do more, then we need an international level, level playing field. It cannot be that other countries do not participate in climate protection as much as we do. And the tendency is there. Um, climate protection is actually a famous and prominent failure of the forces of the market because your own behavior doesn't take into account the behavior of the others. And sometimes you simply are a freeloader. Uh, but if you have too many freeloaders, then that's uh, bad. Um, and therefore, the Paris Agreement uh, has to be closely monitored uh, so that everybody does his bit. And as a final chart, I brought you a thermometer. And what are the current pledges by the countries? I mean, what uh, have they proposed them for themselves, what they were going to do? Uh, and these pledges actually lead to an increase of temperature rather than t two degrees or even less. So we have to be more precise because it's not enough to just look at Europe and within the framework of Green Deal uh, make these uh, aims more visible. But this has to be done in an in international effort. And only then can we be successful, also opposed to other countries that uh, may not be natural followers. So our technology will be a factor of success. And then it does, in fact, not cost very much to save the Earth. Yeah, we'd Danke. like to say thank you to <laughs> Professor Löffel. Please come over here, join us here. We've got a few questions for you and uh, uh, greetings from uh, home. Hans-Peter from Münster, uh, of Münster, um, uh, sends you greetings. So can the CO2 certificates by 2050 be reduced to zero? How will that impact on the 2040s, uh, affect the prices for 2040? The current EU emissions are dropping 2% per annum. The Paris assumes 5% per year. So how is the curve and where are we going to end up? And two important questions. Uh, we're talking about this the global curve. The global perspective is something I talked about. And for one should really say that the, the industrialized countries have to be one step ahead, to be a bit faster, and then we can reach climate neutrality by 2050. And then we can have a look at what the linear chart would look like. At the moment, our target for Germany is 55% 2030. Europe is 40% to be raised to 55%. But even that doesn't match 100% in 2050. We should speed up what we're doing. And the discussions we are currently in, the conversation of the recovery program, every, the, every recovery program which we log lock in uh, will, will remain. It's going to get more expensive the longer we wait. If we look at now, it's better to act earlier rather than later. It always gets more expensive to act later. Changes, the necessary changes become more and more dramatic and cost more. So the best bet is to start early. And you know, look at the coal 
uh, instead of waiting now a long time before leaving uh, coal as a fossil fuel and getting out in the 23rd, it would have been better to leave early. As I said, emissions then are held in the atmosphere and the atmosphere uh, is a kind of bucket over the next 10 years and it becomes much and more difficult to quickly rebuild uh, the power stations. It's We could get out of coal-fired quicker, so that being more dynamic is better. What about economic, global aspects? There's the money. The, co the company, the country could, the state could reduce uh, value-added tax and, and, and give that tax from the um, emission trading back into the country. This return is very important. It's very, because today there are lots of instruments and tools one can use which make products more expensive. Look at the, fl the fleet limit uh, limits. For example, they make cars more expensive. But you don't see those prices, but they are there. In the case of CO2 prices, the prices are transparent. We can see them, and they generate an income. So we get money which can be used. And I think that is an important building block in terms of fiscal policies. We're generating income. And where should they come from? I'm... Uh, I'm chairman of the expert commission for the German energy transition. I would like to use them to push forward with Germany's energy transition and also to provide economic stimulus, for example, by having an energy price reform. So green power is less expensive, CO2 energy is more expensive, but take the money generated like that for the energy renewable energy act in germany but so it is a, it is it would help push the energy transition industry is complaining about its energy costs if you did this price reform there could be money made available and reduce the energy costs so the, in the industries would have lower energy costs it would be good for households uh, their energy costs would reduce the electricity bill would be lower, that would be good for the economy, and also a much fairer way of doing it. In particular, the less well-off households would benefit almost directly, and smaller companies, SMEs, who are also impacted by energy costs, would also be helped. And in GDP, the look at taking the global look, it doesn't cost the world to save the planet. 0.9% um, of economic growth. So if you assume 1.5% economic growth, it would be reduced by 0.1%. But as I said, there are lots of things one can do wrong here. And I just talked about the coal, um, leave, leaving coal, uh, and, and the market would drive the leaving coal much faster. And we can't afford to throw money out of the window. Uh, we don't, we want to, should use the money available uh, to achieve some long-term benefits. That's why the CO2 um, emission costs are a good way of doing it. So you reduce the number of certificates, and you don't, the the companies, the, the the businesses will look for innovations and uh, deliver the reductions. So that's another advantage of that approach. So in terms of green power, where where are we right now? You we're talking about storing energy, green power. It, that's part of that's the work that's going really well. To be honest, we've got um, we've got. Uh, 65% by 2030, that's the target. Because of corona, uh, the demand for power has dropped dramatically and gas prices have fallen. And so there are very few, there's very little coal being fired for power at the moment. And the renewables are making up 50% of power in Germany. So that has been a very quick change. And it would be better to 
to, to help those areas that are doing well and push them forward and those the areas where it's less easy to wait on those maybe that was the graph I showed you earlier for example mobility air transport for example it's very expensive to decarbonize uh, that transport mode so let's look at spending our money on R&D not achieving direct reductions but getting being um, more ready for the future so the, the generating green power that there's lots can be done there but we need to move out of this German approach we need to look pan-European um, uh, to, we need to look throughout Europe to see how that can be done it's very it's been we've seen how difficult it is uh, to um, build more wind turbines for example so we need a European solution we need a European approach offshore photovoltaic uh, in the north and wind in the north uh, PV in the south and wind in the north uh, that should be the focus where the imports of green power and imports of for synthetic fuels uh, we talked about hydrogen instead of importing oil we should be importing hydrogen, uh, ammonia or whatever, uh, and that would be green, and that would then help get nearer to um, the energy neutrality. Um, it all sounds good. Um, we, I just bought a, we bought a new electric car, and we found it's the price is always the same for e-power, for electricity, for for the cars that one should you know why is there no change there obviously the, ch the the state should make that possible by providing appropriate legislation surely smart energy is the word i think we're going to in the, in the state of north rome is failure we are trying to have smart energy so we need more flexibility in the system for example the prices change over time and regionally so they vary for example it shouldn't be there shouldn't be standards or two tariffs. The tariffs should be oriented upon uh, the actual the power in the grid. In the case of high prices, uh, to, uh, if, to to use more, or if uh, the, if the, to use less, or if the prices are less, then to use more. So to have renewable sources, we act like there are two different areas. The grid has to be able to provide this, um, these variable costs. I say smart uh, generally. To, 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 for example, have a disincentive for feeding into the grid when the grid has at, uh, reached capacity, for example. And so, to, to, so when that power I have is worth more, that I be um, incentivized to make that power available when the grid needs it. So we need to be more flexible in terms of power and also in terms of mobility, servant potential road fees for, you know, to when we use roads. So we should have temporary and regional various uh, varying prices, congestion prices, if you wish, uh, for using roads. And so we need systems where such variables are possible. Um, is, do you know, uh, the, the C is, can, is it difficult to prove that CO2 changes the climate? If you look at the conversation of on the climate change, it started a long time ago, 100 years ago, this was already discussed, talking about the concentration of CO2 in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and increasing temperature. That was determined in the 19th century. It was considered to be a positive because it means in England uh, we will have a, uh, a warmer, we'll have a warm bubble over England and that will uh, help make um, life m more amenable in a cold country. But in the future, we need to have a conversation about how. Can
can we withdraw CO2 from the atmosphere? The dynamism here, uh, at some point we will not get emissions down to zero. As we have to do more than that, we have to withdraw CO2 from the atmosphere. How do we use forests or land? And there are lots of um, uh, areas here which are not yet fully probed. There are lots of, um, I talked about these these margins, these um, spreads, uh, and so we're, we're not sure exactly what, to, what we should do. So from a forestry, we should be careful. Uh, these insecurities should be removed and cleared up. It's an interesting question. It sounds a great idea, what you just said. It seems so logical. It seems so obvious. And uh, the solutions seem clear. So why aren't we doing it? And are there uh, circles or people uh, actively obstructing, the, providing obstructions to it? hindering this happening. There are various aspects here, obviously. It's not an attractive political issue to give the solution to the market. It's much nicer if you um, can be tr politically proactive and come up uh, and encourage certain certain sectors. That's, a, that's attractive, politically speaking. We've seen the energy transition is often quite a very, very baby steps almost, and because it's an attractive political way of um, attacking the issue. The, the demand now is that we want to make it more market-oriented and then do without the small, small stuff. Uh, but we want to do it um, more, have more confidence that the market can um, deal with it and leave this um, these gradual approach we had before and the, the, the government funding to let the market markets sort the problem out. That's the moving toward, that's the trend. And uh, the interest, yeah, and you, you didn't ask the question of which forces are acting against all of this happening. We've been doing hearing about the environment since the 80s and the energy, but nothing's happened. Why is that? It, well, lots is actually happening. That's uh, the truth. Uh, we started on a green field looking at resources and we um, we have to have a learning curve, obviously. I said that the state sets the limit and the cap is negotiated. But early on, the emission, early days of emission trading, we allowed lots of favorable or cheap certificates to be issued without major emissions being attached to them. And you know, for example, I'm talking about the joint implementation or the green development mechanism, CB. Um, um, so too much was let in, uh, which was not very effective, and that did not. That meant the emissions achieved were very weren't very impressive, and one wasn't completely aware of what um, economic fluctuations uh, might might um, have an influence. You know, the one assumed that the economic fluc didn't fluct the economics and the businesses didn't fluctuate. It's a long market. It's a long-term market. There are more certificates available, massive enough. There's a huge. There's no demand. The certificates there are more certificates available than are demanded, and uh, gradually the certificates will reduce to zero. And one had uh, hoped that the certificates would be valuable and have a value in the future. So the prices for certificates are driven by political expectations and less by actual um, uh, actual uh, having let fewer available than the demand required. So, and the prices have fallen by nine percent, but the market is now the prices have increased and the market is now having an effect. And as fewer certificates are available, they will gradually have the effect we had hoped for.